Good afternoon to all, and welcome to Seminar 21 of Year 3 of our seminar on Maximus. We are with the volume on Difficulties in Sacred Scripture, the Responses to Thalassius by Maximus the Confessor. We're looking at questions 63 and 64 today, which are page, <laughs> several handfuls of page, 465 to page 518. 465 to page 518. So immediately, it's a lot. Immediately, we have to think about reading Maximus. We've been reading him for three years now. And immediately, we have to think about how we're reading Maximus. And that question of how is, we'll dwell with that question of how a little bit today. So it strikes me sometimes, Maximus is a, is a popular fellow right now in public conversation. And it strikes me when his name comes up that often we are looking for a kind of definition of something or something we could repeat from his writing that would clarify something of our own or bolster our own arguments. That might be the case. We might be reading Maximus looking for definitions. But if that means looking for ways of stating things that leave little room for seeking or for questioning or with no real sense of how to participate in the mystery, then that's not what we're interested in. Maximus, rather than definitions, I would suggest, offers us horizons. He draws us into a place of open light, the open light of Christ. Now, the light of Christ as our horizon illuminates our drawing together in harmony, our drawing near to God. It illuminates it, sheds light on it. But the place of open light of Christ, the clearing of Christ as our horizon, lets there be ease and peace in our drawing together and our drawing near. So it's at ease in the clearing and at peace, and it is illuminated. Our drawing together, our drawing near to God. We read Maximus and we attend to his concepts and to his, his way of phrasing things. And in the, throughout all of his work, but in these passages today, we have um, a handful of, of instances in which the way that Maximus phrased things has been extraordinarily uh, significant for the tradition. Now, drawing near is the basis of all meaning, which also includes drawing together unto new meaning, drawing together unto new meaning. In aesthetics terms, this is a symbol. Things are cast together unto new meaning. In noetic terms, this is a concept, things taken together, held together, unto new meaning. So both Maximus's concepts and his phrases and his symbols are drawing together. And both concept, which is the, 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 the most fundamental unit of, of meaning, and phrasing, which is the basic element of meaning, both concept and phrasing include movements. The concept or the kinesis of the concept, the movement of the concept, indicates the inner dynamism inherent in each word, even the word concept taken together, symbol cast together. Every element of creation is kinetic. The basic unit of, of meaning is relation. But phrasing is also movements. And phrasing means a way of gathering concepts into a relation of beauty. Phrasing is meaning 
concentrated in beauty. And last time we said, when we think of our life just as mortal in terms of time, then our life feels like a death sentence. A death sentence, it's just finished. When we think of meaning in terms of formula or conclusion, like a sentence, and sentence comes from the Latin term sentir, to, or, to feel. The sentence means a unit of feeling, sorry. But if our, our unit of feeling is a conclusion, is a final formula, something which allows no light or interaction, then that also is a death sentence. So our life can be a death sentence and the way we speak can be a death sentence as well. That aside, phrasing means gathering, gathering in terms of beauty, but phrasing also means being gathered with. It's not just a thing we do, but it's, it's how we are. Phrasing means gathering in beauty or in terms of beauty. And since knowledge is participative and of the whole person, It means being gathered with creation in beauty. When we phrase meaning, we are gathering ourselves with creation in beauty. And we remember Maximus says that the basic movement of the devil is to scatter and recombine in cacophony, in enmity. It's the opposite of participation in the beautiful gift of life. But... Phrasing in terms of beauty means beauty is the concentration of our gathering. Phrasing in terms of beauty means beauty is the concentration of our gathering. And this word concentration related with, to beauty and phrasing and gathering is very, very important for us today. First, we should note that concentration is kind of akin to hypostasis. Hypostasis. The movement is the same. They share the same sort of kinesis. Oops. We come back to that later. Gathering in terms of something means concentration. Gathering in terms of something means concentration. And so concentration can be a form of intimacy as long as it doesn't involve dissolution. Right? Concentration to center together. It's a form of intimacy as long as the particulars are not dissolved. Concentration is also a form of immediacy as long as immediacy involves no negation. We said this last week. Immediacy means something like, our path is clear. And immediacy only involves negation. If we think in terms of things, things be stilled into inertia and identification. So it's just there or there, and we have to move it aside to get where we want to go. Just blocking, blocking. If we think in terms of movement, though, instead of in terms of things, then Maximus's argument against intermediaries in question 63 makes sense. There's no thing, no thing. It doesn't mean there are things to be removed. It means that thinking in terms of things is not how to measure the drawing near of human and divine. So the meaning of our being and the meaning of our communication is drawn near in phrases, drawn near in phrases. And each phrase gathers unto a concentration of beauty. 
our being is phrased and our meaning is phrased. And each phrase gathers unto a concentration of beauty. And by beauty, we also mean to kalom, this wonderful, rich Greek word, kalom, good, beautiful. The beauty of our humanity is concentrated in Christ. The beauty of our humanity is concentrated in Christ. And last time we, we were thinking, our own as his own, a phrase we've been using, means our gathered existence, the horizon of our being, our tropos is his own. And that's beautiful. And we also thought of the phrase, mine own as thine own. He said the gathering principle of our being is also thine own. So we can say Christ is both our gathering and the principle of our gathering in beauty. Christ is both our gathering and the principle of our gathering in beauty, which means that Christ is known in our gathering and he's known as our gathering, as the principle of our gathering. Christ is known in our gathering and as the principle of our gathering. So what does this mean? Just to spell out a little bit. To live and to bless and to draw near to things and to draw things near to us and love. That's the blessed life of a Christian. That's gathering, living and blessing and drawing near and drawing near too. But our gathering is not haphazard, nor do we draw near, or rather, nor is our drawing near without fulfillments or without telos. Rather, we gather unto a concentration of beauty. Now, the concentration of beauty in our own, in what is our own, and in creation is the same. It's Christ. And so the integrity of our being and the integrity of creation is in, or rather, is its concentration in beauty, which is Christ. And so when we think of word and silence, word and silence, Word and silence is a revelation of how the gift of the integrity of our being, its concentration in the beauty of Christ, is transposed onto the beauty of creation. And considering silence and word, which means a revelation of how the gift of the integrity of creation its concentration in the beauty of Christ is transposed onto the beauty of humanity. So silence and word are revelations of creation and humanity. gathering, concentration, drawing near. Let's turn now just briefly to the movements of, of healing or wholeness or fulfillment that we've been trying to think of. Lately, we've been phrasing it in terms of form and horizon and transformation. And so we'll do that first, but we've also been phrasing it in terms of apophatic movements or apophatic kinesis. So we'll also phrase in terms of that. Form. The form means the gift. The gift of the living word, the dynamic logos. 
anywhere, everywhere, in all of creation. Form means gift, which means relation. So form involves relation. But then we said form has a horizon. The horizon of a form is what the inner dynamism and felt movement of the gift reveal as a place of the culmination of the relation inherent in the gift of form. So we have form, horizon, transfiguration. The form is the gift, and that includes relation. The horizon of that form is the culmination of that relation inherent in the gift. And then transformation or transfiguration indicate that mystery of encounter where form is drawn beyond its own unto his own. So we have form, horizon, transformation. We have gifts. We have the apotheosis, the drawing unto God of that gift. And then we have the transformation of that gift as it is drawn into God. Another way of putting this in terms of apophasis and being unto. So considering our being as movement, our being as kinesis, without denigration, without disdain, without rejection, our being is and means a movement unto. But that movement unto is not one of denigration or disdain and rejection. Cataphasis, which means kind of according to the, to the same, clarifies. When we speak cataphatically, we are talking about movement unto our own, the gift, clarifying the gift, speaking of what is given. Apophasis, which means kind of of or from the same, clears. It opens up room. And it's the movement unto his own. So when we speak cataphatically, we're speaking about the movement unto our own. When we speak apophatically, we're speaking of the movement unto his own. But they're the same movement together. And this movement is from within, with, through, and beyond. So, from within, we begin within. And that means the gift is whole. The gift awaits only our participation. We don't have to add anything to it. It's whole. And then, from within, with, with. Our beginning, our genesis, is a gift we hold closely. We don't try to surpass what we've been given. We're looking for presence, not succession. And from within, with, and through. Through. Through means by, by means of, kind of purely, with love and not with doubt or disdain. From within, the gift is whole. With, we're talking about presence, not succession. Through, by means of purity. And then beyond. Beyond. Because at some points, or, or place, or stage, I don't know how to put it, we realize that the gift has ushered us beyond the initially perceived horizons, what we thought was the horizon, beyond that, unto new beauty. We phrase this movement two ways, form, horizon, transformation, or apophatic movement from within, with, through, and beyond. And now just briefly, let's talk about movement, form, and time in these terms to see what they, what they tell us about. So first of all, movement movements. 
the horizon of movement is concurrence and the transfiguration of movement is flow. Right? So we begin with movement. It's from within movement, the gift of energy, of energia. And then with and through movement, which we call concurrence. And by that we mean our energy is most its own when it's strengthened in company. So from within movements, with and through it, concurrence, and then beyond unto flow. And Maximus uses flow to talk about when it's not clear if it's active or passive or being carried or carrying um, when it's when it's just the 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 event is that that movement. And so flow means the transformation of movement and concurrence beyond its own, unto his own. And then think of composition. Or rather form. Form, which becomes composition, which is transfigured into harmony. So form is the gift of discretion, right? From within form, we move to composition. So composition means with form and through form. Composition is the horizon of form. And composition means our particularity, our discrete being is completed, i.e. not just isolated, in the presence of peaceful company drawn together, our particularity is most its own with others, with and through others, and then beyond. So harmony is the transformation of form and, com and composition beyond its own, unto his own. We don't know how that happens. All of a sudden we find ourselves not in composition, but in harmony. Or time. Time which becomes narrative and is transfigured into simple presence. Time is a gift of response. From within time, as the gift of response, we have the possibility of narrative. Narrative is with and through time. And narrative means our response makes sense, not as something final, but only in the open space of mutual regard and possible rejoinder. So the gift of response, the horizon of that, the beauty of that is in mutual regard. And then the transfiguration of that is into simple presence, where we, we, we're drawn beyond time and narrative. They're transfigured beyond what we recognize as being of their own, unto his own. And so I think we can say we seek to perceive the movements of the fulfillment of meaning in everything. We want to see and perceive and participate in the movement of the fulfillment of meaning in everything. In Maximus's language, he sometimes phrases this, is and is called is and is called. The is kind of indicates the gift and is called indicates the movements under the horizon of transformation. So this person is and is called. The gift is there and the movement onto the horizon of transformation is there too. We could say that phrase is and is called might also be phrased is blessed and drawn into relation. Right? Or is and is called, could be phrased, is drawn close and heard, heard. Is and is called means that only in movements is one's beauty fulfilled. But when we dwell in that movement and as that movement, the calling, it reveals the incorruptible beauty of the gift of our humanity. I'm just to finish up here. Dwelling and calling as one 
means disposition. In Greek, the word is diathesis. But disposition is good here. Disposition is both kinesis and stasis. It's both movement and stasis. And it's our figuration of ever-moving repose, dwelling and calling disposition. And I think that we could, we ought to hold in mind um, when David Goa's phrase, a disposition of presence. This is what he's speaking about, or what I hear him speaking about. And Max Smith says, the disposition of our soul, the dwelling and calling of our soul, the way our whole being breathes, is taken into account, taken into account with the gift of scripture, which seems identical in form, seems identical in form, like it only saying one thing. But Maximus says it is fashioned in relation to the different dispositions of the faithful that is and is called that transfiguration we've been talking about. When the disposition, when this disposition is neglected, we have what Maximus calls at the end of our second question today, a bare schema. Schema kind of means habits or mode or form. Maximus says a schema alone is like a skeleton without flesh or a tropos without logos. But, he says, reading scripture, if schema is fleshed out, as it were, with substance, hypostasis, then divine reality becomes concentrated in an image or an icon and, as, and is presented often as transformative for one's own disposition. Disposition. Let's move on to the first reading. Um, please have the text handy. This is question 63. I'll do the first little bit of reading. It's um, just a little handful of pages. The overview of this question is, it's about a vision and the vision's illumination and clarification. The theme is Christ's communion with creation and our sense of response, of thought and response. So we'll break down the reading this way. I'll read up to paragraph 63.7 and then Michael, please read paragraph 63.9 to 63.12 and then David Goa Please read 63.15 to 63.18. And then I'll read the final paragraph uh, in the end as well. So we're not reading the whole thing, but we're reading a good deal of it because there's many important things. Question 63, beginning on page 465. First, the question. Again, in the same prophet, it is written... The prophet is Zechariah, the book of Zechariah. And he said to me, what do you see? And I replied, I see and behold a lampstand of all gold, a lampstand all of gold, and on top of it the lights and seven lamps upon it, and seven funnels for the lamps, and two olive trees above it, one to the right of the lamp and one to the left. What is the lampstand? Why is it gold? What is the light on top of it? What are the seven lamps and what are the seven funnels of the seven lamps? And what are the two olive trees? And why is one to the right of the light and the other to the left? Maximus's response. Using symbols to describe the multifaceted radiance and brilliant magnificence of the church, 
the word varied the prophet's vision in the manner you see here, setting forth, it seems to me, the meaning of the new mystery contained in the vision. For the all-praised Church of God is a lampstand fashioned entirely of gold, pure and undefiled, unsullied, unalloyed, undiminished, and receptive of the true light. For they say that pure gold is not darkened when buried in the ground, nor destroyed by corrosive elements, nor diminished when completely submerged in fire, and that its natural activity and effects strengthen and renew the power of sight among those who gaze upon it. Such is the all-glorious Church of God by nature, and through these things it is truly imaged, being analogous to the purest nature of gold. For the Church is unalloyed, having nothing at all in the mystery of theology according to faith that is tainted or foreign. She is pure, being glorious and shining with the brilliance of the virtues. She is undefiled, not being polluted by any stain of the passions. She is unsullied inasmuch as no evil spirit can touch her. Neither is she blackened by material exigencies or harmed by any corrosion of wickedness. The church admits of neither diminishment nor cessation, for she is not consumed in the furnace of periodic persecutions. And when she is tested by the successive outbreaks of heresies in life or word, that is, in practice or faith, she does not undergo the slightest slackening under the weight of tribulation. Thus, for the minds of those who piously understand her, the church by grace is a source of strength. We see this when she calls out to the impious, presenting them with the light of true knowledge, and she preserves those who love to contemplate her mysteries, keeping the eye of their mind clear and unperturbed. She calls back those who have been beset by any kind of tempest, and by her consoling word she renews the mind that has suffered. This, then, according to one interpretation of the text, is how we understand the lampstand beheld by the prophets. The light, which is, on which is on top of the lampstand, is the Father's true light, which enlightens every man who comes into the world, that is, our Lord Jesus Christ, who, by assuming our flesh from us, became and was called a light. Napoleon number one. Not every person coming into this world, he says, is completely illumined by the word, for there are many who remain without illumination and without a share in the light of knowledge. Instead, he clearly means every person coming by his own will into the world of virtue, of virtues. This is because everyone who, by means of his own freely chosen birth, truly comes into this world of virtues, is completely illumined by the word and receives an immovable condition of virtue and the understanding of true knowledge. Main text. Indeed, the enhypostatic wisdom and word of God the Father by nature, who is proclaimed in the church of God through pious faith and a virtuous way of life through the keeping of the commandments, who is exalted among the nations, and who is brilliant, and who brilliantly appears shining to everyone in the house, by which, it, by which I mean the world, as God the Word Himself says, no one lights a lamp and places it under a bushel, but places it on the lampstand and gives light to everyone in the house. This same word and wisdom clearly calls himself a lamp, because being God by nature. He became flesh according to, to the dispensation of salvation. Thus, after the manner of a lamp, he who is light according to essence was, through the intermediary of the soul, contained, but without circumscription, like fire around a wick within the, earth, within the earthen vessel of the flesh. This, I think, is what the great David had in mind when he called the Lord a lamp since he is both the word of God the Father and the natural law. 
saying, Thy law is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my paths. Because he who is my Savior and my God dissolves the darkness of ignorance and evil and is rightly called a lamp in Scripture. For a lamp is what dissolves the night, and night is what those who study words call darkness. Since he alone dissolves the gloom of ignorance and the darkness of evil, he became for all the salvation he became for all the way of salvation through virtue and knowledge, conveying to the Father all those who, by keeping the divine commandments, are willing to, as it were, travel in him, for he is the way of righteousness. Scripture likewise called the Holy Church a lampstand, upon which the word of God shines forth through the church's proclamation and illumines by rays of truth, everyone in this world as though in a house, filling the minds of all with divine knowledge. The bushel is how scripture, through a mode of symbolic fashioning, there's that fashioning, disposition fashioning, symbolic fashioning, refers to the synagogue of the Jews, that is, the corporeal worship prescribed by the law, which, on account of the grossness of its literal symbols, completely failed to recognize the light of true knowledge contained in the inner meanings of the letter. The word in no way wishes to be kept under this bushel, but rather to be placed at the height of the majesty of the church's beauty. Otherwise, when the word is confined by the letter of the law, as by a bushel, it deprives everyone of the eternal light, offering no spiritual contemplation to those who endeavor to cast off sense perception as something deceitful and deceived and capable of grasping only the corruption of bodies sharing in that same nature. And this is why, as I said, he wishes to be placed on the lampstand, that is, on the church, by which I mean rational worship in spirit. His aim is to enlighten all, teaching people throughout the world to live and conduct themselves solely according to reason and to be concerned about the body only in order, in order to cut off completely, through much effort, the soul's attachment to bodily things, and to give the soul absolutely no image of anything material. He urges them to make this task their eager pursuit, since reason has already begun to extinguish sensation, which in the beginning pushed reason aside and embraced the irrationality of pleasure like the snake that creeps upon the ground. In Scolian Tooth. Here he understands the woman as sensation and the serpent as pleasure, for both are diametrically opposed to reason. This is why the sentence of death was justly handed down, namely, to oppose sensation and thereby prevent the devil's entry into the soul. Here's fully in three. When sensation subjects the intellect to itself, it teaches polytheism. For with each sensation, owing to its enslavement to the passions, it reveres each sensory object as if it were divine. For sensation is one, according to genus, but fivefold according to its form, and it convinces the, the deluded soul through the apprehending activity of each of those forms to cherish what is sensual and similar to it in nature and set of God. Thus the person who wisely follows the way of reason before he is overtaken violently and involuntarily by death condemns the flesh to death, completely separating the inclination of the will from sensation. On the other hand, whoever adheres solely to the letter of Scripture has nothing but sensation ruling over his nature, and this reveals the attachment of his soul to the flesh. For the letter, when not understood spiritually, contains only what is sensory, which restricts the meaning of the text to its verbal utterance and does not allow it to pass to the level of the intellect. And if the letter engages sensation alone, 
Then everyone who receives the letter literally in a Jewish manner lives according to the flesh. Moreover, such a person voluntarily dies the daily death of sin on account of sensation's vitality, because he is not able, by the Spirit, to put to death the deeds of the body in order to live the blessed life of the Spirit. This is why the Apostle says, If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put the deeds of the body to death, you will live. Therefore, having lit the lamp, that is, the illuminating word of knowledge, through contemplation and action, let us not place it under the bushel, lest we be condemned for using the letter to circumscribe the power of its incomprehensible wisdom. Instead, let us place it on the lampstand, by which I mean the church, in the height of true contemplation, burning with the light of divine dogmas for all to behold. Using figures, the law quite likely proclaimed the church in advance, prescribing that the lampstand should be made of closely pressed and finely worked gold, the former because no portion of the church is without a share in the power of the word, and the latter because she is absolutely free of all material excess and every earthly thing. Astonished upon seeing this somewhat unusual lampstand, the great Zechariah observed that together with the light there were also seven lamps upon it. Here we must understand the seven lamps differently than the lamp in the gospel, because things pronounced in the same way are not always understood in the same way. Instead, each of the things described is to be understood in relation to its underlying meaning, that is, in light of its place in scripture, if, that is, we wish to specul speculate correctly concerning the aim of what has been written. My sense is that, in this passage, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Scripture, pardon me, depicts as lamps the activities of the Holy Spirit, or rather the gifts of the Spirit. And it is natural for the Word to give these gifts to, gifts to the Church, since he is the head of the entire body, upon whom, Scripture says, the Spirit of God shall rest the spirit of wisdom and comprehension, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and piety shall fill him, the spirit of the fear of God. If the head of the church of Christ, pardon me, if the head of the church is Christ according to the principle, the epinea of his humanity, then the church has received him who, being God by nature, possesses the Spirit and the activities of the Spirit. For the Word becoming man for me also accomplishes the whole of salvation for me, giving to me in return through my own things those things that are proper to him according to nature. He gives these things to me for whose sake he became man, and taking on these things for me, he reveals that which is his. And as a friend of mankind, he considers the grace given to me as his own. And he ascribes to me his power of those accomplishments proper to him, according to nature. And it is for my sake that he is now said to receive that which belongs to him by nature, in a manner without beginning and transcending reason. For just as the Holy Spirit, by nature and according to essence, exists of God the Father, so too, by nature and according to essence, is the Spirit of the Son, insofar as the Spirit proceeds essentially from the Father, ineffably through the begotten Son, giving its own proper energies like lamps to the lampstand, that is, to the church. For in the manner of a lamp that dissolves the darkness, every energy of the Spirit is of a nature to expel and drive away the manifold <clears throat> manifestations or coming into being of sin. Genesis. Thus wisdom destroys folly. Comprehension takes away the lack of knowledge. Counsel abolishes the lack of discernment. Might casts off weakness. Knowledge obliterates ignorance. Piety banishes 
and piety and the depravity of its works, and fear drives away the callousness of contempt. For not only are the commandments light, but the energies of the Spirit are also light. Okay, I'll begin with um, 60, carry on with 63.9. The Holy Spirit brings about purification for those who through fear and piety and knowledge have become worthy of the purity of the virtues. There's a scoring attached to that. Fear, piety, and knowledge, he says, bring about practical philosophy, strength, counsel, and understanding, on the other hand, firmly establish natural contemplation in the spirit, but divine wisdom alone bestows mystical theology. Back to the text. The spirit bestows illumination concerning the genesis of beings and the principles of their existence to those who, through strength, will, and understanding, have become worthy of his light. The Spirit grants perfection through the most brilliant, simple, and complete wisdom of those who are worthy of divinization, and without any intermediary, it completely leads them upward toward the cause of beings, as much as this is possible for human beings. Those, I mean, who are known only by the divine characteristics of goodness. According to this goodness, they know themselves by knowing God, and they know God by knowing themselves, there being no kind of intermediary separating them from God, for between wisdom and God, there is no intermediary. They will, moreover, possess unchanging mutab immutability, since they will have passed through all the intermediaries in which there was once a danger of erring with respect to knowledge, and in ineffable, unspeakable silence and in a manner beyond knowledge that is unutterable and inconceivable, they will be led up by grace to the summit which is infinite, and for all infinity is infinitely beyond all things an infinite number of times. And there's a scolian attached that long passage, which reads, he calls the essence of sensible and, and intelligible realities intermediaries through which the human intellect is of a nature to be led toward God as the cause of beings. Back to the text. And seven funnels for the seven lamps above it. The contemplative interpretation of the lamps, it seems to me, has now been put forward through two approaches. We may henceforth embark on the interpretation of the funnels. They say that this funnel is a kind of container in the form of a cup in which People customarily put oil that is poured into the lamp for the maintenance and preservation of the light. According to the anagogical interpretation, the funnels of the seven lamps are the habitual states and dispositions receptive of the different principles, modes, and behaviors that nurture and preserve the seven lamps, that is, the activities of the spirit among those in the church who have received the distribution of spiritual gifts just as it is impossible for a lamp to be kept lit without oil, so too it is impossible for the light of the gifts of the Spirit to be kept lit without a stable, sta stable habit, which nurtures good things by means of principles, modes, behaviors, thoughts, and proper reasoning. For every spiritual gift requires the proper habit, which unceasingly pours upon it, like oil, spiritual substance in order that it continue according to the habit kept by the one who accepts it. Thus the funnels of the seven lamps are the habits appropriate to the divine gifts of the Holy Church, from which, as if from receptacles according to the example of the wise virgins in the gospel, is poured the oil of gladness by the wise and vigilant guardians of the good things handed down to us. And two olive trees above it, one to the right of the light and one to the left. The word beautifully and most fittingly fashioned this vision so that the that it would converge evenly toward itself for having mentioned the lampstead, the light, the lamps, and the funnels. He also introduced two olive trees. It was necessary, and it was truly necessary, that together with the light we also grasp the generative cause of the power that preserves the light so that the light might not cease from the lampstand stand, being extinguished because of the uh, lack of sustenance. 
For this very reason, the two olive trees of the golden lampstand, which is the Holy Catholic Church, are the two testaments. From these, as if from olive trees pressed through pious seeking and inquiry, the power of intelligible meanings flows forth like olive oil, nourishing the light of the divine gifts. This power fills each person's habitual state in proportion to his proper capacity. And thus he watches over the unquenched light of grace that is proportionate to him, preserved like oil by the intelligible meanings derived from the scriptures. Just as it is impossible to find genuine oil naturally and truly without the olive tree, and just as it is impossible to contain the oil without some kind of reservoir that is receptive of it, and just as the light of the lamp surely goes out of it if it is not supplied with oil, so too, without the holy scriptures, there is truly no possibility for intelligible concepts or meaning suitable to God. Without a stable habit of mind like a reservoir, receptive of intelligible meanings, divine meaning could never be sustained, and if the light of knowledge and the gifts of the Spirit is not nourished by divine meanings. It will not be preserved unquenched among those who possess it. Thus, rightly elevating the prophetic vision for spiritual contemplation, our interpretation likened the lampstand to the church in the light to the incarnate God who put on our nature according to hypostasis and without change. The foregoing interpretation also likened the seven lamps to the Spirit's gifts, that is, activities, as the great Isaiah clearly foretold, and it likened the funnels to the habitual states that are receptive of the divine meanings of Scripture. These states belong to those who accept the divine gifts. Further, it likened the two olive trees to the two testaments from which the power of the divine meanings, when wisely cultivated, naturally emerges and through which the light of the divine mysteries, when sustained, is preserved, unquenched. So this is section 6315 through 6318. <clears throat> this is how then a person who rejoices in the intellectual contemplation of Holy Scriptures will understand the lampstand seen in the vision as well as the light. As for the seven lamps, you will take that to be the distribution of the various gifts of the Spirit, which, in accordance with the interpretation given above, mystically shines and rests upon whoever becomes perfect according to Christ through virtue and knowledge. This is because Scripture acknowledges as Christ whoever lives according to Christ. For such a person is distinguished by the same ways and words as far as this is possible. If that is, he too possesses wisdom and understanding, will and strength, and knowledge and piety and fear, to which, as if through spiritual eyes, God is said to look upon the whole earth of each person's heart. For there are seven eyes of the Lord, it says, that watch from on high over all the earth. And seven funnels for the lamp unto it. Funnels are the practical and contemplative habits of those who are worthy of the distribution of the divine gifts, from which, as though from a reservoir, they pour out as if it were oil, the power of mystical con conceptions, thus keeping unquenched the light of the gifts of the spirit. By the two olive trees, one may understand, as I said a moment ago, the two testaments, the Old Testament on the left of the light 
which is the cognitive part of the soul, that is the contemplative part, generates like oil the practical modes of virtue. And the New Testament on the right, which in the passive part of the soul, that is the practical part, generates through contemplation in an ever flowing manner like oil, the spiritual principle of knowledge. We have Scolia 8. The Old Testament, he says, provides a person of knowledge with the modes of the virtues. Well, the New Testament gives true principles of knowledge to the person engaged in ascetic practice. Back to the main text. The aim is that through both the light of theology, like a light, together with the innate gifts of the spirit, might be further strengthened, furnishing from the Old Testament the modes that honor knowledge through practice, and from the New Testament the principles that illumine, illuminate the practice of the virtues through spiritual contemplation, so that from both a single beauty might be realized, namely the mystery of our salvation, reckoning life as the proof of the word and the word as the glory of life and practice as actualized contemplation and contemplation as practice being initiated into the mysteries. Scolia 9. Whoever he says has embodied his knowledge by means of practice and ensouled his practice by means of knowledge has found the precise mode of true divine action. But whoever possesses either one of these in separation from the other has either made knowledge a mere mental phantom or his practice a soulless idol. For knowledge without practice in no way differs from fantasy, since it does not have practice providing it with a, a foundation in reality and practice deprived of reason is no different from a soulless idol since it does not have knowledge to give it a soul. Back to the main text. To state the matter briefly, it makes virtue the revelation of knowledge and knowledge, the preserving power of virtue. And through both, by means of virtue and knowledge, it shows one wisdom being established in order for us to know that the two testaments, according to grace, agree with each other in all things unto the completion of one mystery. To a greater degree, than the body and soul can sigh uh, to a greater degree than the body and soul can side with one another in the creation of one composite being. Scolia 10. In the same way, the soul and body produce a human being through their composition. The concurrence of ascetic practice and contemplation constitute a single cognitive knowledge. So too, the old, the first, and the new, the second testaments together realize a single mystery. Back to the main text, text 6317. But if someone aspiring to intellectual contemplations, cho chooses to call the two olive trees, the two laws, I mean the natural and spiritual law, he will not have departed from the truth. 
on the one hand, the natural law being to the left of the light, that is, to the left of the incarnate God, the word, will be understood as bringing to reason through its uh, connatural sense perception, the modes of virtue present in sensible things. And there we have Scolia 11. The natural law on account of sense perception is on the left, leading reason to the modes of the virtues and putting knowledge into operation. The spiritual law, on the other hand, on account of the intellect, is on the right, mingling the spiritual principles that exist in beings with sense perception and filling practice with reason. Back to the main text. On the other hand, intellect of law, that is the spiritual law, being on the right through its connatural intellection, gathers the principles present in beings unto spiritual knowledge. Whenever these two laws, whatever, whenever these two laws have filled as though through funnels, the various habits of spiritual gifts with practical and cognitive contemplations, we preserve unquenched the light of the truth. When considered from the perspective of higher knowledge, perhaps this passage of scripture through the two olive trees to the right and left of the light is pointing to providence and judgment. In the midst of these stands, I mean in the midst of the holy Catholic church or in the soul of each holy person, as if upon a golden lampstand spreading the light of the truth to all, the word, who as God contains all things and reveals the truth and most general principles of providence and judgment that hold all beings together. It was according to these principles that the mystery of our salvation were ordained before all the ages and accomplished in these latter times was realized. Thus, we behold providence as if it were an olive tree standing to the right of the light in the ineffable manner of hypostatic union with flesh rationally endowed with a soul. And we see this by faith alone. Scolia 12, providence, he says, is manifested in the words union, according to hypostasis, with the flesh. Well, judgment is seen in the words accepting to suffer the passions on our behalf. Through these, that is union and passion, universal salvation is constituted. Back to the main text. And to the left, in a manner beyond words, we recognize judgment in the mystery of the incarnate God's life-giving suffering, which he underwent for our sake. Inasmuch as he is good, the former came about first according to his will, for by nature he is the savior of all. Scolia 13, the incarnation, he says, took place for the salvation of human nature, whereas the passion took place for the redemption of those who because of sin were under the power of death. 
back to the main text. Inasmuch as he loves humankind, he consequently endeavored the latter voluntarily and with forbearance, for by his nature he is the redeemer of all, because God did not first become man in order to suffer, but rather to save man through his suffering, because man had subjected himself to suffering when he transgressed the divine commandment, even though in the beginning he was impassable. Paragraph 63.24, page 482. If, though, by the two olive trees, Scripture is intimating the two worlds, by which I mean the intelligible world and the sensible world, this would also be a good way to understand the text. Standing in between these is the Logos, as God, mystically inscribing the intelligible world the intelligible world so that it appears by means of figures in the sensible world, teaching the sensible world by means of its inner principles that it truly exists within the intelligible world. And there's a scrolling. Whoever turns his intellect to the visible world contemplates the intelligible world. For using his power of imagination, he imprints intelligible realities within sense perception and on the level of intellect, he gives shape to the inner principles he has beheld. In this way, he brings the structure of the intelligible world to bear in a variety of forms on sense perception and brings the composition of the sensible world in a complex manner to bear on the intellect. Thus, on the one hand, he grasps with his intellect the sensible within the intelligible, having transposed sense perception to the intellect by means of the inner principles. And on the other hand, he grasps the intelligible within the sensible, transposing by means of the sensible figures and with true knowledge, the intellect to sense perception. Right. That's the conclusion of the of the question and response. Let's think a little bit about a couple of kind of moves of, of mind or thoughts that Maximus makes here. And then let's focus in on paragraph section 63.7 a little bit more closely, which Michael read, or which was read earlier. First, just in that last paragraph, 63.24, this is about the relation of sens sensible and intelligible or sensation and intellect. And he puts it in terms of appearance and existence. All right, fair enough. He also says the noose or the, the epinia, that kind of means what's gathered from the noose, the concentration of the noose, like epicenter, epigram, uh, epiphenomenon, <laughs> epigraph. So the concentration of the noose is the gathering point of union for the sensible and the intelligible world. And he says also that human art is the phrasing of the harmony of the two in the light and in the clearing of Christ, drawing the sensible into the intelligible and the intelligible into the sensible. That's what we do. And then also he has this word transposed, wonderful word, wonderful word. Transposed kind of means <clears throat> apprehended in renewed beauty by way of a kindred register, a kindred key. So it's apprehended in renewed beauty by way of a renewed or uh, a kindred key. Early on in this response, <clears throat> Maximus says that 
symbol means a renewal of the fullness of meaning. That's how he begins. And he also says the letter is not opposed, but rather opens unto the Spirit. Right? There's no abstract definitions. That would be just literal or letter. All is addressed, and so there's no strictly literal. It's all addressed. And the letter, he says, opens according to the, the noose, the mind present. And then turning to paragraph 63.7, just briefly. So he begins, if the head of the church of Christ, according to the eponia of his humanity, if the head of the church is Christ, according to the eponia, the principle of his humanity, then the church has received him who being God by nature, possesses the spirit and the activities of the spirit. So first of all, the head of the church is Christ according to the concentrated beauty of the noose. Then, he phrases the Holy Spirit here. He includes each of the, of the Holy, uh, sorry, phrases the Holy Trinity. He included each, each, each person of the Holy Spirit. He relates them, rather. And he says the church has received God, God by nature, received. And then the next sentence, for the word becoming man for me also accomplishes the whole of salvation for me, giving to me in return through my own things, those things that are proper to him according to nature. He gives these things to me for whose sake he became man, and taking on these things for me, he reveals that which is his. So here we have phrased beautifully the part of the mystery we've been drawing near to. The word has accomplished the whole of salvation for me. The gift is whole from the beginning. And his own is deemed our own, Maximus says. And therefore, in revealing us, the beauty of humanity, he is in a way revealing his own. Moving on. As a friend of mankind, he considers the grace given to me as his own. Think of that as a friend, as a friend. And he ascribes to me his power of those accomplishments proper to him according to nature. This is a phrasing of our life of co-response. We're responding, but we're taught the response. The response is part of the gift, and so we're responding out of the gift. And so both gift and response are from God. And then the last, or, or the next sentence. Just as, and just pay attention to as and so, and the, of, and then especially the word of, and especially the word through. Because that's the, it's just those words which are guiding the whole purpose here and have been um, very significant for, for everyone after. So think of just as, so, and then, the of the, which is a belonging beyond enumeration. For just as the Holy Spirit by nature and according to essence exists of God the Father, so too, just as, so too, by nature and according to essence is the Spirit of the Son. The Spirit is of the Father and the Spirit is of the Son. That itself is a is a theological nuance, but also it teaches us about belonging beyond enumeration. This is math overturned, not new numbers overturned. Insofar as the spirit, insofar as the spirit proceeds essentially from the Father, ineffably through the begotten Son, 
giving its own proper energies, uh, like lamps, to the church. Of, through, the, of. The last sentence here in this, in this section. For not only are the commandments light, but the energies of the spirit are also light. We have no burden ever from God. No burden ever from God. Everything is light. Every gift is light. Right. Let's let's move on to question sixty-four. Um, I'll read out the question and then just the first paragraph and, and one example briefly, and then. David Jennings, if you could read uh, section 64.15, and Michael Burke, if you could read 64.16, and David Goa, 64.17. Please. The question and... 64.2. First question. What is the meaning of the statement in the prophet Jonah concerning Nineveh, which says, in which more than 12 myriads of men dwell who do not know their right hand or their left? The literal sense provides no solution to the problem. For example, the text did not say children, so that I might think it is not speak, sorry, so that I might think it is speaking of infants, but rather it says men. What kind of men, being of sound mind, is unable to distinguish his right hand from his left? Tell me then, who are these men, and what are the right hand and the left hand, according to an anagogical interpretation? Maximus response. None of the things written in scripture, persons, places, times, or other things, whether these be animate or inanimate, sensible or intelligible, have their literal or contemplative meanings rendered always according to the same interpretive mode. That is why the person who endeavors to receive unerringly the divine knowledge of the Holy Scripture must allow for the differences of the events and sayings and give each of the things enumerated an appropriate interpretation consistent with its place or time. This is because the names of each of the things signified in Scripture, according to the possibilities inherent in the Hebrew language, in fact have multiple meanings, which is exactly what we find here in this passage. And throughout this response, Maximus is examining at length the multiple meanings of names and figures and events. But turn to 64.7, page 491. Here are two of the main figurations of the event of Jonah that Maximus gives us, and then we'll move on to his reflections. Just the first part of 64.7 on page 491. Perhaps the prophet Jonah found himself in these circumstances when, figuring within himself the passions of humanity, which humanity wretchedly inflicted upon itself, he made, himself, he made his own the things of our common nature, adapting most fittingly to himself as a type of Adam, the meaning of his name, which means flight from beauty. That's one, Jonah as our common human nature. But when, on the other hand, he prefigures God, he prefigures God, who for our sake came to us and became like us through flesh possessing soul and intellect, save only without sin, he sketched out in advance the mystery of the economy of salvation and the sufferings associated with it. Thus he signifies the words descent from heaven into this world by his passage from Joppa into the sea. And he points to the mystery of his death, burial, and resurrection by being swallowed by the whale and emerging from it intact after three days and nights. And then Jennings, please, continuing with 64.50. Maximus is meditating here on our contemplation 
on theoria. Sixty-four fifteen on page four nine nine. <clears throat> Moreover, every soul made radiant by contemplations of intelligible realities has acquired men who do not know their right hand or their left. For every soul, having withdrawn and contracted its discursive power from the contemplation of nature and time, possesses, like these men, natural thoughts that surpass the number 12, because such thoughts no longer toil in relation to the principles of things subject to nature and time. To the contrary, they are concerned with the comprehension and true understanding of divine mysteries. And for this reason, they do not know their right hand or their left. This is because the rational knowledge of the virtues, that is, the true and active knowledge of the causes of the virtues, is of a nature to produce complete ignorance of the excess and deficiency that are found. Like right and left hands on either side of the mean of the virtues. For, oh, that was 15, just the one? There's a scholar in there, though, no? Oh, I'm sorry. 15, scholia 15. Scholia 15. God is the cause of the virtues. Actualized knowledge of God is when the habitual state of the one who knows God is transformed in the direction of the spirit. Sixty four sixteen. For if by its nature there is absolutely nothing irrational in reason, then clearly one who has been elevated to the rational principle of the virtues will by no means yield any place to the irrational. And Nadra, were you, were you going to read the scolia? Scolia sixteen. By means of the virtues, God says. Pardon me. By means of the virtues, He says. The principle of nature elevates the person diligently engaged in ascetic practice to the level of the intellect. By means of contemplation, the intellect leads to wisdom the person who desires knowledge. Irrational passion, on the other hand, persuades whoever disregards the commandments to be dragged away toward sensation, the end of which is the attachment of the intellect to pleasure. For it is not possible to observe two opposite realities at one and the same time, nor to imagine that one can simultaneously appear with the other. For if no rational principle of faith can be found in the lack of faith, and if light by nature is not the cause of darkness, and if one cannot point to the devil and Christ at the same time, it is clear that absolutely nothing contrary to reason can coexist together with reason. Here's another scolium. Scolium 17. By unbelief, he means the denial of the commandments. By faith, he means acceptance of the commandments. Darkness is ignorance of the good, and light is the knowledge of the good. He called Christ the essence of these and their subsistence, and the devil their worst habitual state, which gives birth to all the vices. And if nothing contrary to reason can possibly exist by any means together with reason, then the one who has been elevated to the rational principle of the virtues does not, as I said, acknowledge any place for things contrary to reason, because he knows only virtue, and he knows it only as it is, not as it is thought to be. There's another scolium. Scolium 18. Virtue is what he calls the most dispassionate and fixed habitual states in relation to the good, on either side of which stands nothing, for it bears the characteristic mark of God, to whom nothing stands in opposition. This is why he knows neither the right hand through excess nor the left hand through deficiency, for in both of these things one may clearly see what is contrary to reason. And there's a scolian number 18 attached to that. We just read 18. 18. Oh, pardon me. Um, 
Okay, for if reason is the limit and measure of beings, then being moved contrary to that limit and contrary to the measure, or again to move beyond the limit, that limit and beyond that measure is equivalent to the absence of reason and is therefore irrational. Sorry, I'm, I'm reading that um, again. Anyways, there's a scolian number 19. Um, 2019. If, as is natural, an inner principle determines the genesis of each being, no being is naturally superior or inferior to itself. From this, it follows that the limit of beings is their desire for and their knowledge of the cause of beings, and their measure is their actual imitation, as much as this falls in their power, of the cause. For both alike, cause those who move in this manner equally to fall away from that which really exists. The former does this by persuading them that the movement of their course is unclear and without limits, since the intellect's lack of measure does not possess God as its foreordained goal, and thus they are shaped more to the right than the right itself. It's Golian 20. When, he says, the desire of beings in motion is carried beyond its limit and its measure, it deprives the course of their movement of meaning, inasmuch as they do not arrive at their goal in God, in whom the desire of all that is moved comes to rest, receiving as their self as their self-subsisting goal, the enjoyment of God. The latter does this by persuading them, contrary to their goal, to conduct the motion of their course solely in the direction of sense perception, since the intellect's lack of vigor makes them think that their foreordained goal is to be confined within the realm of the senses. Scolian 21. When, he says, the desire of beings in motion is carried contrary to its limit and measure, it deprives the course of their movement of meaning. For instead of God, they arrive at sense perception, in which they find, in which they will find only the non-subsisting enjoyment of impassioned pleasures. But the one who is ignorant of these things, having no experience of them, is the one who is united solely to the princip rational principle of virtue, to which he restricts the entire emotion of his intellect's proper power. And for this reason, he is not able to think of anything either beyond reason or contrary to reason. Section 64.17, page 501. If, however, someone with the ambitious desire to extend his intellect toward an, ever, an even loftier meaning, he will, of course, understand the right hand as the rational principles of incorporeal beings, and the left hand as the rational principle of corporal beings. To be sure, the intellect has been, the intellect that has, without qualification, been extended to the cause of beings will be absolutely ignorant of these rational principles, contemplating no principle in the reality of God, who by essence transcends every principle as far as all causality is concerned. Scolia 22. <clears throat> Whoever fattens the flesh according to the letter of the law by means of bloody sacrifices possesses a desired ignorance, receiving the commandments solely to indulge his pleasures. Back to the main text. Such an intellect being contracted toward God and away from all beings knows none of the principles of the beings from which it has withdrawn, but beholds solely the one to whom it is drawn near by grace and in a manner beyond interpretation. 
David Gold, pardon me, would you mind reading the final paragraph too, please? It's on page 514, please. In sum, if the word of scripture presented us with a man grieving over his tent and a gourd plant, by which I mean his flesh and the pleasure of the flesh, and presented God caring for Nineveh, then it is obvious that when compared to what seems precious to human beings, that which is beloved by God is far superior and far more precious than everything that exists, to say nothing of things that do not exist and which only seem real because of an error in judgment, but which in fact have absolutely no principle of existence, being nothing more than a fantasy, deceiving the mind, providing passion with the empty appearance, but not the reality of things that have no being. Thank you. Let's just have a few thoughts about this last paragraph and then open it up. We've read a lot. This, this question and answer, which in part seems to me to be about gift and response or about our comprehension, not of the is, but of the is called. And that's what Maximus seems to be clarifying for us here, how we understand the is called. And so here, just in this paragraph itself, scripture presents us with an image. And the image is both literal and contemplative, so to speak. Early on in this response, Maximus says, both literal and contemplative readings are not the same for each person. Right? They're both varied. And so it's kind of in the relation of literal and contemplative readings that we're able to discern something of God present. Here, Maximus says, presented God caring for Nineveh. And then he speaks of comparison. Comparison. Human things compared to that which is beloved. Comparison, they're properly in union. So thinking of comparison is already a little bit odd because be that which is beloved by God is all existence. And so apart from what is beloved by God is non-existence, Maximus is saying. And so he says, can we speak of things that exist and don't exist? David Goa has more than once wondered at the fact that we can live unreal lives. We can live lives that do not exist, as it were. But how are we even able to speak of things that do not exist? And I think partly Maximus is saying, when we detach the image from reality, when we think in terms of fantasia instead of icon, and that, I think, is a suggestion of, of the kind of the, uh, the first sin. The first, the first way we go wrong is we think that our image of something is where it's at. And then just the last, the last paragraph, or the last sentence, rather. Being nothing more than fantasy deceiving the mind, providing passion with the empty appearance, but not the reality of things that have no being. Figuration, apart from flesh, is deceptive. The incarnation is our mode of truth. And fantasy is figuration apart from flesh. But also here, and we just read it in the footnotes, the word translated passion is pathos, and the word translated appearance is schema, and the word translated reality is hypostasis. And so in English it reads here, providing passion with the empty appearance, but not the reality of things that have no being. Fair enough. We could also read it, our translator says, providing experience, not passion, just experience, 
with the empty schema, some, some kind of shape. Not appearance, it's not coming into being. We're not doubting our eyes, just the shape. But the shape does not include the hypostasis. He says reality or substance. But we could say hypostasis or concentration of things. And so another way of phrasing this last phrase, another way of putting this last phrase, slightly less dramatically, but no less profoundly, I think, is sometimes our experience, if it is just of the schema and lacking the hypostasis, the being, or the concentration of being, is without reality. He's not a dualist here. He's not a Gnostic here. He's talking about the movement unto, which provides our being with truth. But the most important thing to note here is that it's difficult reading things that are translated variously. And if you go word by word translation, definition, then you can get in trouble. It shows us the value of phrasing, of how things are phrased together, right? moving together in beauty, rather than just defining this or that word, which can get us into trouble if we separate with it. Let's open it up. It's long. What is Maximus drawing forth from us? What is he drawing us near to here? Even beginning in this last paragraph. How do we slip into non-existence? What does the story of Jonah teach us about this? We have uh, held forth a lot today, but we can begin um, anywhere we like. The focus mostly has been on how do we respond to these stories? How do we respond? It's not quite a focus on hermeneutics, but it's, it's very much there. I was provoked, this goes really back to the beginning. I was provoked a little bit by his description of the all glorious church of God. And um, as I read it a couple times, I wondered if, uh, what happens if we kind of turn it the other way around from the way in which he puts it? So let me just give you a touch of it. This is 63.2, page 466. For the church is unalloyed, having nothing at all in the mystery of theology according to faith, that is tainted or foreign. <clears throat> she is pure, being glorious and shining with the brilliance of the virtues. She is undefiled, not being polluted by any stain of the passions. She is unsullied inasmuch as no evil spirit can touch her. Neither is she blackened by material ex 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 exogenesis or harmed by any corrosion of wickedness. The church admits of neither diminution nor cessation, for she is not consumed in the furnace of periodic persecutions.
And I thought of what for him in the throes of being called to the court, in the throes of being accused, in the throes of the struggles around how to understand Jesus Christ and how to understand the incarnation and how to understand what it unveils for the human person. It seems to me to be a full frontal critique, although that's not never his spirit, of what we see the church as all the time. All the time. And if you think of our Orthodox Church these days, I mean, it's a nightmare. So, what's he saying? Um, she is pure, unalloyed, not stained by passions, not sullied by evil spirits, not blackened by material exogenesis or harmed by the corrosion of wickedness. So where is that? Where is that? I mean, it's, it's wonderful when it's like that, which it is sometimes, my little experience in the little ship of fools that, that I go to as my liturgical family. It's wonderful when it's like that in the somewhat larger church which we are part of. But if we turn it around and say, oh yeah, the church is, it's not that it isn't in my precinct, but it's only in my precinct when it's unalloyed, when it's not tainted, when it shines with the brilliance of virtue. And in fact, that's where the ecclesia is. It's where that kind of clarity and unalloyed condition is. There is the church. And what's amazing about it is, of course, that can be anywhere. I suspect even where the name of Jesus Christ is not known because it's speaking about the light. It's speaking about the incarnate word. Or do I have it wrong? <laughs> David, if I could follow up just kind of, I, I like that very much. And, and then if you would just think a little bit about then what is the the what is revealed with the mystery of hypostasis as being kind of the meaning of something? We were talking about concentration earlier. It seems to me that you're you're pointing to not a kind of not a kind of ease of identification, but the movement of truth within is where we can speak of the reality of. And that, in a way, is concentration. But also, we understand kind of personhood, or even the personhood of Christ, as a as a kind of a gathering unto a, a, a unity of truth, something like that. Is there something there between the two that that you could? It's where it's, um, it's, where it's incarnate. Isn't isn't that the point? Also, a hypostasis. It's where it's incarnate where it is present, where it's enfleshed but not bounded, 
not presumed, welcoming and thanksgiving. You know, David, in every tradition, we have this reflection on yeah. the that the bride of Christ, yeah. I mean, Maximus takes it to the church as the cosmos. Um, that that's what it that's what it is. And yet <laughs> yeah. um, everybody has to struggle with the, yeah, but that isn't what we got. So are we not the church or um do we is there a seen and unseen church is there a um you know the, the church visible the church invisible as calvin writes about or others trying to figure out how do we get this but you know this now and yet not and, and not yet um uh, that we have through our you know of, of whether it's kingdom or otherwise um that the church is a symbol that reaches beyond our present reality to something greater and profound and mysterious and wonderful um, seems to be consistent with the entire gospel. Um, and, you know, all you have to do, I mean, it's not anything subjective. You can just read Paul in Corinth or anywhere else, you know, and see the mess that we humans <laughs> To make of an institution, but it 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 is also glorious because we are the bride of Christ. Um, and when you read through, as I say, you're, you're I think you're asking exactly the right question. You read that and say yes, but that's not us now. But it but we should not be allowed to define what the church is. Christ defines who what the church is. And, and, it's where, and it's where the word is present. Where the word is present, exactly. Where the lamp is lit. To pick up on his images here. Yeah. And but even when the lamp is lit, I mean, it's a messy situation. You know. Because you're in community with those um, who are all you know, in various levels of divinization um, and passions and all that sort of stuff. But yeah. without 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 the word being present, then it's it's not the church. Yeah. Yeah. And when it is present, the mess is just part of you know. Well that's what we're called to heal. Yeah. And, you know, going to the charming, I probably shouldn't use that word, but I found a charming reflection on Jonah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's in Nineveh. Yeah. Yeah. It's in Mosul. It's in the city where there is a metanoia, where there's a sudden turning around. And... <laughs> where there's sackcloth and sorrow and recognition and thanksgiving for the fact that we've finally seen. That's an unalloyed moment. So the way in which he also works with <clears throat> uh, the notions here of, of judgment and Christ's descent and the three days and, in a sense, nature call back to itself. It's then unalloyed. Yeah, well. 
David, David mentioned Maximus thinking of the church as the cosmos, and and you just mentioned um, nature, and there's the same ambiguity in the, the word nature. At times it's something degraded, at times it's something that seems to center our aspirations of divinization, and it's a um, a kind of um, a, a kind of um, degradation of nature that leads us in the wrong path, and and I I suppose we can't unless we're playing a kind of um, you know hide and seek um, game with our our um, deepest beliefs about the cosmos. Obviously, all of um, nature has, is an evolved nature, and, and then it's fraught with um, problems and in, and in insufficiencies and arbitrariness as it adapts as you know physical nature evolves and biological nature adapts to circumstances every living creature adapts to circumstances but and so from that standpoint you know things can look deeply flawed and it's hard to think of um the church or the cosmos as a church and yet um you know we couldn't make sense of any of this if it wasn't a ubiquitous fact that the logos invades all of reality we wouldn't you know and i think we were hoodwinked by the the messiness of um time or what what occurs in time and and that that's probably a good point to think of what is eternal in time you know to, that might be one way of not not resolving because I, I i i'm not suggesting any kind of cheap theodicy but um, or easy theodicy rather, but but um, th there are these striking tensions, and and you, they can't just be dissolved. Otherwise, we have to um, pretend we don't see reality as we see it to the best of our lights. But um, you know, as as, as Maximus um, continually yeah. suggests, if we separate um, the our sensory um, input. From our intellect and not simply intellect as a way of um, quantifying over sense data but intellect in a in a deeper sense that um reaches beyond our empirical methodologies if we don't do that then we are systematically deceived notwithstanding the stunning um fruitfulness which is a great temptation of um the point where we're at now when we can quantify with staggering levels of precision and usefulness um all of this you know all of our observational data and put it to um, good use yeah. well i don't need to look further than myself you know <laughs> I, you know, you can sit down and read Maximus and you're in the heavens, just in the glory of it. And then just the mess of my life uh, and the contradictions and the hypocrisies and the everything else there, the word is present and indeed belief, but man, what a, what a puddle of <laughs> contradictions is the nicest term I can think of to describe my life. Um, especially, especially when you're in the midst of a major um, move. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm glad I'm not limited to the mess of uh, of the life, you know, but the promises of something much different than that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, this this might be a bit of a tangent, but um, at least in the Anglican churches last week, uh, we were talking about Paul musing about the nature of um, the, the resurrected body, which is obviously, you know, a, a difficult subject to to broach but you know that I don't, i'm not sure where i'm where i'm going to go with this but whatever the resurrected body is and, and the kind of infinite energies and in life that it makes us fit for 
um, would provide a kind of contrast, but unfortunately for us, it's a it's a, an elusive contrast. It's a promise, but not something that we can um, flesh out um, in our imagination very far, which is um, fa fairly obvious in the um, all of Christian and Jewish scripture. You know, kindred discipline. It's not not so obvious unless you have a um, more of a mystical approach to the um, Quran. I didn't really mean to invoke um, Islam at this moment, but I <laughs> felt um, in this this moment, I I I I was like I'm sure a few of you kind of queasy reading, and and you have to put it in its you know his obviously in a in a context maximus's um polemics against um um the jewish religion and the contrast he provides but it's um i'm not i'm not suggesting we um broach that that topic but it's quite um quite quite striking it's it provides for us probably a kind of stumbling block but if I suppose you have to localize this to um, Jews in the first century confronting the word, something of that kind of contextual order to, to accommodate those passages where, um, where um, Maximus berates um, the Jews for their obtuseness even even while um you know commending is in indissolubly linked the the old testament and the new testament that's important yeah. to bear in mind well as david said earlier the spirit of critique is not in maximus so whenever that kind of thing happens something else is going on have another another way it might be fragmentary this kind of thing where we're at now i had this question down to um ask about the church and i'm glad you brought it up go i i shied away at the end i think i was just so tired from all the meaning that we've already walked through today it's it's exhausting all this question of the church the temptation is i mean each of you have walked strode through this the temptation is to look around and go how could this be it and either give into a temptation of time, like it was better before, or it will be better then, or a disappointment, we're just not up to it, what have you. That's the danger. Or to start looking around and saying, we're doing it, but they're not. Or they're doing it, but we're not. You know? Become comparative like that. I don't know if this is fair to say, so I'm going to say it, but I'm saying it with um, reverence and humility, and I'm open to correction. It strikes me um, that many of the of the great figures presented in the Jewish scriptures were figures that were partly rejected or wholly rejected by their community. And yet, that's a holy people of God. It strikes me in, in most of what we just said that throughout the, the history of Christianity, we've done a pretty good job rejecting or resisting as much or condemning as much of its truth as possible we we not 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 against we inside and in an odd way the history of the holy people and the history of the church is a history of just recurrent rejections like we just we just we keep turning away we just keep doing it. and yet Israel is called a holy people, and the church is described in ways that we just heard again. And I don't know if that's true. First of all, that's fair to say. It might not be fair to say. I don't know if it's true. But also, and I don't know this mystery either, but Christ has said that he uses our weakness and our brokenness to reveal himself. And he says that he... I mean, we were reading Athanasius last week, 
And at one point, Athanasius says, some people wonder why Christ didn't kind of come as a conquering deity, you know, to blow everyone away. And some of us still wish for that in, in a kind of dark corner of our heart. We think, no, oh, come on, get rid of all this stuff. Come on. But that's not the truth, not, not what we're taught, not what's revealed. But what we do know is that we collectively, humanity, has been pretty good at rejecting or turning away from the gift ever since we've known about it. And I don't know if that's anything, but that, that strikes me as another way to think of the church and of you know, the holy people. No matter what else is said or no matter how much difficulty we have in terms of this or that of our own, that's there too, somehow. And that's who Christ came to. That's us. We're lost. We're the lost. We're the injured. We're the away. I want to just say, uh, respond just a touch to what you raised, Michael. I wonder when those bishops, including patriarchs, who were so afraid of Maximus, when they read this, did they not see that he was simply saying, this is how Jesus Christ's people in their brittleness, not when they were present to the word, but in their brittleness, responded like you were responding. Um, it's a rhetorical device uh, because we are the inheritors of anti-Semitism. We need to be careful about this stuff. But in the liturgy of the church, there's a lesson. There's a real lesson in the great liturgies of the church. Because in the great liturgies of the church, on Great and Holy Friday, we are the Jews. I don't know how this is articulated in Anglican literature, but or liturgy. But in the drama on the day of crucifixion, everybody gathered is saying, give us Barabbas. So this is, a, this is a type of a dimension of the human mind and the human heart. It's not a people. The same as Gentiles is. In, in Maximus's uh, play with these images. So, The danger of removing, removing that from our tradition and moving it or reducing what the church fathers say to the legacy of anti-Semitism is that you are pretending that you as a person and, and that the so-called Christian communities Aren't that yeah. the virtue of keeping it there? I don't have any, any uh, way of assessing how this should be handled, but the virtues of keeping it there is that it keeps that part of me there. So I think of somebody like Chris Austin who, of course, there have been lots of books written about his anti-Semitism when he was in Antioch. But if you look at that situation in Antioch, which was, at the time of Chrysostom, at least half the population, if not more, was Jewish, and a fair number of those people, under the influence of Chrysostom's eloquence, 
the golden mouthed one, had entered the church. And then when he uh. said, look what this means, look what this means. You, you seek to become with Jesus Christ. This is not a family religion. This is about the stranger and the other. And at that point, they said, no, give me the family religion. I want to return to that. So a bunch of them are returning to that. And they're returning to it precisely because he was saying, look at what Genesis 3 says. God made man, male and female, in his image and likeness, all of them. You're afraid of that. You don't want to accept that. That's Jewish teaching, you know. So it's not as if the Jews don't have it. And it's not as if we don't have it. But I think in his rhetorical use of this in Chrysostom's, and I'm not saying this is the whole picture, but it is a piece of the picture, certainly. And it's certainly a piece of how the liturgy works. This is to say that within the sweep of the biblical revelation, all of us are Jonah. All of us are, all of these things are in all of us. And alas, alas, not wanting to face that, we turn Jews into a scapegoat. And that, of course, is pure evil. And uh, but when we do that, you know, what are we doing? We're the high priest that walks by on the other side. We're the Levite that walks by on the other side. So I think he's, he uses that language in places, but what's he pointing to? He's pointing to an inner condition. He's pointing to a disposition. And it's not, I mean, it's, I was thinking as I was rereading this again this morning, and it's another little passage he makes. I was thinking again that I can't imagine that he hadn't spent time with rabbis and hadn't absorbed some of the Hebrew language. He's constantly referring to it. So, um, he also, of course, says some things about women or the feminine but we use these we use these images and we use them as symbols of something and of course then the danger is the <laughs> danger is is that you actually reduce people to it but that is the temptation of sin all the time and maybe the limitations of language but but i don't mean to i don't mean to counter what you're saying michael but no no i i wasn't really um saying anything i was just you know kind of expressing um wondering about a, it. a kind of um you know a, i don't know just a cognitive dissonance of a sort, I suppose. Which I I think you know you um, kind of ease by contextualizing um, Maximus and looking at similar analogous uh, contexts. And of course, in the Jewish community, when 
good Jews go to shul on Shabbat, they stand up with their prayer shawl and their kippah. And what does their prayer say? Well, they have a large prayer, but there's a little piece of it that says, I thank you, Adonai, that I was not born a woman or a goyim. Is that Jewish? No, it's a revelation. It's a way of trying to get that infection out of your mind. So all kinds of things in our prayer are like that. They're projections. And we need to listen to them as they bounce back off the heart of God. To remove it is also to deprive us of the capacity to listen to it. It's bouncing off the heart of God, I think. Or at least I wonder. Yeah, by not smoothing out these kind of um, difficulties, we, um, we're not able to be complacent. I mean, it's we, we could... That's the problem with programs of, um, you know, deletion and um, and rejection, or what? What is the word that is on the top of everyone's um, mind? Now you say the wrong thing. Part, pardon me. Canceling. Cancel. Yes, yes, yeah. That's the problem with um, a kind of a cancellation culture. And if it, if you extend that, you know, through rich traditions, you you impoverish them. It doesn't get us off the hook. We still have to struggle with the, um, with you know all manner of strange things that percolate up to the surface, right. liturgy and scripture and so on and so forth. At the same time, I think there are things that have been handed down to us that we that have become embodied in in liturgy and in texts, which. Um, which have become, um, and within our context, require us to think twice about, about this. And I would say, in order to remain orthodox, in order to be stable about what the revelation is saying, sometimes you have to change in order to stay the same. So, I mean, in, in my judgment, issues like uh, a kind of uh, gross failure to recognize that, that, that words move around a bit. And when they move around, sometimes they take on a different meaning. Um, you have to to make some adjustments to that. I, for my part, would would like to, out of my vanity, rewrite portions of the liturgy for the Sunday of Orthodoxy, because it has a whole series of anathemas in it towards various and sundry people. Now, what does anathema mean? What did this mean when it was formed? What was going on there? What does it mean now? Another one to me is the, um, certainly for my mother, when you said man, it meant her. Yeah. For my daughters, it doesn't. So some of these things I think are so simple and so easy to, to shift. Not in a wholesale way, because you can also do away with some of the symbol system by that, but at least to some sensible effect. So where, I mean, we ought to have a bunch of anathemas that have to do with our own time <laughs> at this point. <laughs> But we get very nervous about that. So, so it's it, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a struggle. 
Well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to depart. Good to Thanks. see you, David. And I love your new artwork <laughs> of that piece. This is, the, this is the old house. Next week, you'll you see have, it. You have the broom behind you. Yes. I can see what you are really treasuring today. That's right. <laughs>